Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special webinar indeed. I'm Elsa Churchill, the genealogist at the Society of Genealogists, one of the data partners of Find My Past. The Society is the largest and oldest genealogical society in the country and has a remarkable genealogical library and education centre in London. Having been founded over 100 years ago, the Society is well used to helping and advising family historians with their research problems. Believe me, we all have them. While we can't always guarantee to solve your particular problems or find things that just don't exist, we do believe there are general themes and issues that are common to many genealogical conundrums, and I hope this talk will give you some ideas and insights into your research and give you something to think about and apply to your own family history. The talk will look at case stuck ideas and ideas for solving problems, and we appreciate that you might have a number of questions to ask as we go through this presentation. So don't forget we've got a box on the left for you to ask any questions you like. But if you'd like to wait until the end and see if everything is answered during the presentation, that's fine too. We'll have some time after I've finished where we'll stick around and you can keep asking those questions. When approaching any genealogical problem, it's essential that you ensure that your research is and has been done in the most effective and efficient way. Hence this talk will help you to develop research strategies in identifying where the gaps are in your family history or possibly in your knowledge of the sources, considering the various ways in which the missing information may be discovered, investigating how and where to find the relevant information, determining the priorities and the logical or most practical order in which to approach the research. These are all part of developing a research strategy to make the most effective use of your time that you have available to study and explore your family history. It will also help you to be realistic in your expectations. Not every line can be traced. In my own family, I have only one line that goes back to the 1660s, and that's as far as the records survive. Other lines commonly stop around the mid to late 1700s, with a not unusual occurrence of a couple seemingly turning up in a parish, having children baptised, but with little or no clue as to where the parents married or came from, if not the parish they ended up in. That doesn't make me a better or worse genealogist, it just means I've gone as far as the evidence and sources currently let me. Considering what constitutes proof in a genealogical context can be a challenge. Certainly you don't want to delude yourself or anyone else that something is true when it's not. The Society of Genealogists publishes its principles of research that any good researcher should abide by, and which generally ask for honesty of research, the use of good and clear evidence to prov provide a logical argument. These concord largely with what are known as the genealogical proof standard, that ensures that before you accept anything as genealogical proof, or fact, you should be satisfied that you have made a reasonably exhaustive search for all pertinent information. That means, have I searched hard enough? A complete and accurate citation to the source of each item is used. That means, can I or someone else repeat this? Analysis of the collected information's quality as evidence. Does my theory hold up to scrutiny? Resolve any conflicting or contradictory evidence. Don't delude yourself. And finally, arrive at a soundly reasoned, coherently written conclusion. Make sure it makes sense. The most important principle is that evidence only becomes proof through a reasoned and logical analysis and an argument capable of convincing others that the conclusion is valid. Your conclusions must be based on evidence and your arguments stand up to scrutiny. Some people may wish to find two or more sources as evidence for a particular fact, but I would like to think it's the quality, not the quantity, of your evidence that counts. I'm quite active on Twitter as SOG Genealogist, and in preparation of giving the same talk as part of the SOG Intermediate Level Family History Skills Evening Class, I conducted, conducted a quick online Twitter survey of the top tips or advice that genealogists would give their fellow researchers in order to solve a genealogical conundrum. Overwhelmingly, they insist that you should review, review and review again your findings, going back regularly to recheck what you have done in the light of new information or new sources made easier to use online or elsewhere. Getting a fresh eye on the subject can help by talking to other researchers and there are plenty of genealogical societies, online forums, mailing lists and user groups, website support teams and even the society's own expert volunteer consultants at Who Do You Think You Are Live to offer assistance. The very act of sorting out your, in your mind what it is you need help with can clarify a problem. Another good tip is to look at the family and neighbourhood as a whole rather than in, as an individual. So be aware of siblings, cousins, etc. We'll look at this in more depth later on. 
When I prepare to approach any genealogical problem, whether for myself or to help another genealogist, I find I'm always having to ask the fundamental questions. Who, what, where, when, why? Who are you looking for? Do you actually know their names? That might be the name they used informally rather than the name they were registered with. Everyone knows me as Elsa, but that's not the name my father had put on my birth certificate, much to my mother's surprise. And because I don't like that name, I rarely use it, and it's on very few documents. The type of person will influence what can be found. Are we dealing with an agricultural labourer or a lord of the manor? But remember, the ag labs worked on the manors and farms, so knowing who their employers or landlords might be may be important too. What are you looking for? A baptism, a birth, a marriage, death or burial? What information do you hope to find from that source? Can another source provide the same information? Where might the event have occurred? Do you know the parish? Can you narrow it down to a county or just a country? Or sadly, we're searching everywhere in the world. When might that event have taken place? Is it the 16th or the 20th centuries? Time and context are crucial. It's vital, for example, to know that you only get births or death certificates in England and Wales after the 1st of July 1837, or that the procedure and location of wills differs before and after 1858. Why are you stuck? Usually, it's down to having too many or too few possibilities. Are there gaps in records or the gaps in your knowledge? Do you simply have insufficient information to go any further at present? It's a good idea to pause and reflect reasons why you may be stuck. Think about what might have built that brick wall. Has there been a transcription error? Can you check against the original record? Might it be helpful to search other databases or search in a different way? Are we seeing evidence of movement or migration from place to place or are we simply searching in the wrong place? Has there been a change of name or a wrong name recorded? Remember, under English law, you can call yourself what you like, providing you have no intention to defraud. Few formal changes of deed poll are actually registered centrally. Are you working entirely under a false premise? Is there a possibility that the event might not actually have been registered or recorded? Are we the victim of bad clerks or sloppy record keeping? Given how so many genealogical sources are related in and integral to the places where our ancestors lived, it's vital to have an understanding of place and the local community. You will need to understand which registration district covered and recorded the places where your ancestors' births, marriage and deaths occurred in order to identify the appropriate entry in the GRO indexes and be aware that these changed over time. A couple might have married in a church but which wasn't actually a parish when they were born, say 20 or so years earlier. At the time of the transition years between the census of 1841 and 1851 and using parish registers, and when populations grew and towns developed, many new ecclesiastical parishes were carved out, out of earlier ancient parishes. So you might need to establish just what was the parish at the time if you want to go and look for a baptismal entry. It's better to be aware of place rather than just stick a pen and a map and hope that's the right place to search. The Society of Genealogists Library collects sources for places where our ancestors lived. Note it's absolutely vital to be aware of the area covered by the sources. It may be an index to tax records for a whole county, or a rate book or a local history of a particular parish. In addition to parish records, the Society has the largest collection of monumental inscriptions, recording the tombstones and memorials in churchyards and cemeteries, which may supplement and add extra information to the burial record. Name-rich inhabitants lists, such as trade directories, may provide exact addresses to help find someone in a census, and poll books showing who and how they voted might supplement parish registers. Records are seldom used in isolation, and when used together to build up the picture of evidence, sometimes all you can establish is that an ancestor was alive at a certain time in a certain place. Many of the older pedigrees at the SOG use the term flourishing or flurriot, meaning that they're alive between certain dates, rather than precisely noting the date of birth, baptism, marriage, etc. I hope that you could find more than that, but if you know at least when your ancestors were living and where, you may have a chance to go further. Maps are incredibly useful, and you will look at many time and time again during your research. Perhaps the most useful maps designed expressly for genealogists are the parish maps published by the Institute of Heraldic and Genealogical Studies in the Philomore Atlas and Index of Parish Register. You should find the atlas in any good library, 
And if you're going to buy any one book for your own genealogical reference collection, I would suggest this. You can purchase the county parish map singularly from the IHGS in Canterbury. The atlas contains a series of maps covering every county of England, Wales and Scotland, giving the name of each pre-1832 parish, showing parochial boundaries, probate jurisdictions in colour and the date of the commencements of registers. It's accompanied by topographical maps from Bell's 1834 Gazetteer of England and Wales, showing the hundreds, roads and topography of the county. The parish list at the back of the atlas show the earliest and da latest dates of surviving registers, the appropriate registration district in 1851, and which major indexes and finding aids cover the parish. Using a large-scale ordnance survey or topographical map to plot the places where your ancestors lived is useful. My Herefordshire ancestors seemed to move steadily over a period of 200 years down the old Monmouth Road before finally moving across the border into Wales. Not only have they crossed a county boundary, in this case they've moved into another country. Please don't kid yourselves that your ancestors didn't move. They may not have moved far, but they certainly could use a parish church or burial ground convenient to them. Be aware of the size of your parishes. Where did they live in relation to the church? Are there any outlying chapelries? They may wander by foot, by horse and cart, and as transport and communications by post chase, canals, trains, planes and automobiles develop and improve, they could go some distance. A really useful online resource is the 1851 Jurisdictions Data Place, made available by the Family Search database as mapsfamilysearch.org. This will show parish maps and the parishes in re relation to each other, with the database giving information about the earliest surviving parish registers and bishops' transcripts, if the parish contains significant hamlets and non-Anglican denomination congregations. The jurisdictions will show the relevant county, ecclesiastical probate courts for wills before 1858, the diocese, rural deaneries, poor law unions, hundred and province, which will affect each record that should be used by family historians at the appropriate time. The interactive maps give you the opportunity to do useful things, like list neighbouring or contiguous parishes, undertake a radius place search, search the Family History Library catalogue, search the Family History Historical Records, or search the Family Search his Research Wiki. Here are the contiguous parishes within five miles radius of the parish of St Wenners in Herefordshire, shown as a list with distances and on the map on Family Search Historic Maps 1851's jurisdictions. There are a number of free software options to help establish your distances between parishes or identify neighbouring or contiguous parishes, so as to broaden the search method methodically and sensibly using a ripple method rather than picking any old port in storm and similar functionality can be found on many genealogy software programmes. You can list the nearby parishes, as shown here, or get a visual representation of parishes radiating out from your parish of interest, but this doesn't take account of local topography, roads or transport routes that might be shown on a good ordnance survey map. Software, like Surname Atlas, can localise and plot the numbers and density names onto a map using the frequency and location based on the 1881 census. This might get, help you get a start of where the name might be commonly found. Let's have a look at indexes. Nowadays, genealogists are more reliant on finding information in index records, and many more records are becoming available in index digital form online. But of course, not every, everything is, on, is yet online. Hence, you have to think which index records have the broadest coverage, such as indexes to the decennial censuses and GRR indexes for England and Wales, which have been completed for the country, and which, have coverage of the, and which records ha, or indexes have coverage of a more limited nature, perhaps only by covering the baptisms, marriages and burials of a county, or those held in a particular record office. You may need to look at name-rich sources, such as directories, tax lists, wills, etc., that supplement more commonly used records. But as there's yet no one database that, that has everything, you'll have to look widely, though of course Find My Pass would say they're working on it. It's absolutely vital that you establish if the index records actually cover the place and time you need. Are there gaps in the original records that mean gaps in the index? Is it possible that information might have been misread or mistranscribed in the indexing process? Can you be flexible in the way you search the index records? This is an opportunity to talk about online search skills and strategies. Remember, less is more. You may not need to complete all the boxes on the database or narrow your search down. Start with less and filter on or narrow down if there are too many results. Be aware of possible transcription errors or how the original clerk may have spelt your name. Can you use wildcards or character replacements? I believe the first letters of names and places 
are the most often misread or misrecorded item in any transcription. Play around to see how abbreviated forenames such as WM or WM for William or JAS for James or JN for John might have been dealt with. Variant spellings may not come up. Can you search under forename, age, place or birth etc. rather than by surname? Be aware that enumerators and clerks copying the records made errors too. Search all versions of indexes available. Results can differ between da databases and websites. And I think local expertise may recognise local names and places better, so do look out for indexes compiled by local family history societies. Obviously, the 19th century census returns are key documents in identifying and learning more about our ancestors. They not only provide evidence which can help to improve lines of descent, but they can also place individuals in the more meaningful context of their families and neighbours and the wider framework of their local and social surroundings. At the very least, they provide a snapshot of the family living together on the night of the census, showing ages and relationship within a family and vital information about places of birth. However, there may be reasons why it could be a challenge to find a particular ancestor in these records. Remember, the national censuses were conducted primarily because of the government's need for information about population growth and distribution in view of economic and social changes in England and Europe in the late 18th century. War with France made it important that the government knew the size of the population and how many people could be taken away from working on the land to defend the nation. They were not intended to prove material for future family historians. So we're very lucky to have a wealth of detail relating to the greater part of the 19th century. The census was instituted in 1801 and taken every 10 years thereafter. However, those for 1801, 1811, 1821 and 1831 are essentially headcounts with little personal information about individuals and very few fragments remain from these records. It's those from 1841 that are of primary interest to family historians as they are the first to record all the family by name. Let's just remind ourselves what you'd expect to find from the censuses from 1851. The full name, but that often admits middle names or gives admissions. The sex, relationship to the head of the household, the age, last birthday, the parish and county of birth, and occupation. Extra information in the household schedules completed by the occupier in 1911 includes more information concerning the length of marriage, the number of children alive or dead from that marriage, and soldiers overseas are enumerated which means soldiers overseas didn't appear in the earlier censuses and soldiers in England and Wales are recorded in barracks from 1851 to 1901, usually listed at the end of the district and the Navy is only listed in ships in home ports from 1861. People in, in institutions such as prisons, workhouses or asylums may only be noted by their initials rather than their full names which might entail some clever searching using only age and place of birth to track them down, rather than search by name or forename or surname. The 1841 censuses look different and has less information. They it was taken later in the year, in June rather than April. The ages are usually rounded down to the nearest five years for adults over 15, but the enumerators didn't always follow that instruction. Place of birth is, is defined as whether or not in the county of enumeration, and if not, that, if not that county, then it's only noted whether it's Scotland, with the letter S, or Ireland, with the letter I, or foreign parts, with the letter F. Addresses may be no more than a street or even a village name, and often only one forename is recorded. The 1911 census is the first census that retains the household schedules, rather than have, having had them copied into enumeration books. So you could be looking at your ancestors' handwriting, and there's extra information than in the earlier censuses. So now you can start putting the family tree together following the clues in the census. A useful way to represent the information and make sense of it is to construct a pedigree or family tree of each person placed on their appropriate generation level based on what the census is telling you and what you infer from what is or isn't recorded. So here we can see three generations of the family living together. It's absolutely vital to follow the family back in each census. Let's have a look at a family I'm most familiar with, and I'm afraid you will be too after this talk. Here we see my grandfather, Prothero Churchill, aged 17 in 1911, living in the Welsh mining town of Tredegar, with his parents William and Elizabeth Anne, and some siblings, and a cousin, 
or rather someone who is described as a niece of his father. Note that William gives his place of birth as Broadoak, but doesn't say in which county, although the census clerk has helpfully added England. Be careful about the ambiguity of relationships stated in the census. It took me quite a bit of digging to establish exactly how Florrie is related to this family, and it's more complicated than niece. In fact, it turns out she is Elizabeth Ann Churchill's first cousin once removed, and Elizabeth's son's, son Prothero Churchill is Florence's second cousin. Florence and Prothero are the great-grandchildren of James Green, born around 1794 of Zeals in Wiltshire, and who married in Gillingham in Dorset. It's important to follow the family back in all possible earlier censuses. In 1901, we see the family with all four of the living children indicated in 1911. Here, William gives his place of birth as just Herefordshire, but no town or parish is given. And Jane Green turns out to be his mother-in-law rather than his mother, as stated here. Following the family back in all censuses finally gives a picture of what's going on. William Churchill says he's born in Broadoak or Herefordshire in three censuses, but Herefordshire is enough to identify the right William born around 1858 in the GRO indexes. His birth certificate shows he is a son of William and Mary, born in what turns out to be the hamlet of Broadoak in the parish of St Wenard in Herefordshire, but we only find him with his father William living together in St Wenard's in 1871 and 1861. William Senior gives his place of birth at St Wenard and this is borne out by a baptism in that parish in 1825, the son of James and Martha. James and Martha can be found living in St Wenner's in 1841, but where is William Senior, their son? The young single Churchills tend to be found living some way from home as farm labourers or farm servants, and this may well be the case for William, born around 1825, as he's certainly elusive in the 1841 census. There is, however, in the same parish of St Wenner's, a William Church, who is about the right age if you round the ages down to the nearest five years. But there's no William Church baptised in the parish at the right time, so how, we, how might we add weight to my theory that this William Church and William Churchill might be the same person? Well, it turns out that William Churchill's elder brother John Churchill carried out a nasty assault in 1846, which led to him being convicted and deported to Tasmania in 1846. That criminal trial in the local Herefordshire Assizes is reported in great detail in the Herefordshire newspapers digitised on Find My Past and the British newspaper archives. William appears as a witness in the trial, where I should point out the judge calls him the more respectable brother. The defence case tries to, pro to prove that the victim, Mrs Morris, had falsely accused John after an ongoing feud with the Churchills. She in turn is adamant she had the right man and that she could swear positively it was John and he is sometimes called Church. It doesn't always turn out as neatly as this. Another useful genealogical technique is to look more widely at extended family members. Who are your ancestors associated with and who are their neighbours? Some genealogists called this the FAN, F-A-N technique. Family members may be witnesses at a marriage, bondsmen on a marriage bond, godparents, etc. Cousins and siblings should be identified as, of course, they will have similar ancestry. If you can't find an ancestor's birth certificate, can you find his brothers? If you have three James Churchills living about the same time and the same place, can you establish they are perhaps cousins and have the common ancestry via their grandfather? Association could be the people your ancestors worked with, or attendees at the same church. I've once established that a surname used as a second forename didn't indicate a marriage with that name somewhere up the tree, as it often does, but rather the second surname as forename was given in honour of the master, to whom the father of the child had served an apprenticeship. Neighbours, of course, are those who live nearby, and it's certainly not unusual to marry the girl next door. Remember William Churchill Jr. living with his wife Elizabeth Anne and his widowed mother-in-law Jane Green in 1901? Well, here he is with his family in 1891. You have to be careful when a family appears on the bottom of the page, as the Churchills do here in the bottom of the left-hand picture, as the family is enumerated on the following page, continuing with the youngest son, Arthur E. Churchill. I wish I paid attention to the neighbours when I found the Churchills, as when I came to research Jane Green and her husband, George, I had a certain feeling of déjà vu, as I'd definitely seen this census page before, and it seems that William Churchill and his wife lived only a few doors down from his in-laws, the Greens. While the census, of course, shows households living next to each other, it doesn't give an account of the relationship between neighbours. Here we see the, the William Churchill Sr. 
and his family living next door to the Vaughans in St. Wenard in 1861. There is an interesting report in the Herefordshire Times of the 6th of July 1861. Mary, the wife of William Churchill of St. Wenard's, gives evidence against neighbours James and Elizabeth Vaughan, accused of aggregated assault on their 14-year-old son, Andrew Williams. Andrew describes Elizabeth as his mother, so I assume James Vaughan is his stepfather. Mary witnesses seeing the bruises, and Elizabeth is ultimately imprisoned for her assault. Note William Churchill's sister Martha married James Vaughan's brother Noah Vaughan, so these two families were related as well as neighbours. The Churchills and Vaughans lived next to each other for some years. Here they are in the 1841 census with Richard Vaughan living next door to James Churchill in Penrose Green in St Wenards, and other Vaughans and Churchills are noted around the village. The addresses in the censuses are ambiguous, with most of the Aglabs living in small tenemented households. The tithe maps and apportionments at the National Archives were compiled in the 1840s and can supplement the census with more detail and show exactly where the cottage and garden occupied by James Churchill was and the tenements and gardens occupied by Richard Vaughan and his son Noah, the Noah who went on to marry James's daughter Martha. In addition to censuses, the lifeblood of family history are the records of the civil registration of births, marriages and deaths. In England and Wales, information must be bought in legally certified form from the government. The information wasn't designed for family historians, but we are good detectives in looking for the clues that the certificates hold. So, in this birth certificate, we see that the father's name is left blank, presumably indicating an illegitimacy. If the mother wasn't married, she couldn't cite any man as father of her child unless he was present to acknowledge paternity. In this marriage certificate, we have evidence of a change of name from Samuel Richards to the rather more exotic Kemp Forrester. A good job both names have been noted in the GRO indexes. Note, of course, that name, changes of names can be informal and may not be registered. The death certificate shows an accidental death with the informant as the coroner, another clue to be followed up as coroner's inquests are invariably reported in the newspapers. I should add that the death certificate can be one of the most unhelpful documents, especially for anyone just beginning their research. Often, the, inf the informant isn't a family member. I get so many people contacting me saying they would like to discover where an ancestor was buried. Perhaps they want to visit the graveyard or look at a tombstone. Unfortunately, they just don't know where to look because what happens to the body isn't recorded on the certificate, even though the local registrar is informed and keeps that information for a few years, it's not retained. Even a name as unique as Prothero Churchill can show issues in index records. Sometimes there's an E added to the end of the name. The GRO entry for his marriages has him noted down as Prothers, which only came up by using the asterisk or a star in a truncated search looking for Prov with anything following afterwards. So what can you do if you simply can't find an entry in the National GRO indexes of birth? You'd think it would be easy to find the birth entry of an esteemed former member of the Society of Genealogists, Hubert Kendall Percy Smith, but finding the entry in the GRO indexes has defeated me and many other searches, so perhaps we can find that information elsewhere. Of course, there are issues with a double-barrelled name, as in this case. Is the surname noted in index as just Smith or Percy hyphen Smith? What do you think of the accumulated evidence that I've put together? He was a renowned genealogist and expert on Indian genealogy and military history. He was a fellow of the Society, and an obituary of him appears in the Society's journal, The Genealogist magazine, in 1975, saying he died in his 78th year. Now, from the June quarter from 1969, the death indexes should show the date of birth, rather than the age of death. But unfortunately, the informant at the death must have been unsure, as the certificate, hence the indexes, say only born around 1898. He attended Shrewsbury School, and this public school has a published list of students, which says he was born in 1897. There's an online biography of Indian Army officers, which gives his date of birth as the 9th of September 1897, and this is confirmed by Percy Smith himself in his own birth brief, deposited at the SOG, as all members are encouraged to do, which says he was born in Tong and gives his parents' names. Now there's a baptismal entry for him on Find My Pass from the Tong Parish Registers, and this is annotated with the date of birth, even though the vicar wasn't required to note this, so we've been quite grateful to have that information. It's interesting to note that the baptism is recorded out of sequence, so something was definitely odd here. 
Given that most of the evidence suggests a birth in Tong in Shropshire, it's possible, of course, to apply for records from the local registry office where the event should have first have been recorded, rather than from the National General Register Office records. You'll have to use websites like Genuki, which stands for Genealogical Research in UK and Ireland, or the UK BMD website to establish not only what would have been the registration district at the time of the event, but which office covers it today. Some local districts are working to make their local records indexed online too, and the UK BMD website will be a useful portal to discover these. In 1897, Tong was in Shifnal Registration District, then later in Wellington, Reeking, and now it's Telford and Reeking District. On the basis that all the information I'd found suggested the birth should have taken place in Tong in, in September 1897, I contacted Telford and Reeking, who kindly did a free search for any entry for a suitable birth for that day. Unfortunately, nothing was found. So we're back to the drawing board. Hubert and his family are found in the 1911 census, and he has brothers and sisters, and it suggests how long his parents, Horace and Ada Mary, have been married. There's an index entry for the marriage of his parents, Horace Percy Smith and Ada Mary Hill, which suggests they were married in 1885, as was confirmed by this birth brief at the SOG, so it doesn't look like we're dealing with a hidden illegitimacy. Hubert's other siblings are all registered, as they should be in Shifnal District, and noted in the indexes as Smith, so why not Hubert? So let's be creative with wildcards looking for any child Hubert or Herbert, leaving the surname blank, using therefore the asterisk as a character replacement, but limiting the search to Shropshire. Now there is an interesting entry I want to follow up. Is it too coincidental to note an index entry for Herbert Percy, not Hubert, and the surname is Hill, the same as his mother's maiden name? Has the certificate been entirely misindexed? The district isn't too far away from Tong, but Maidley isn't exactly what I was expecting. I'll let you know when the certificate's arrived if I'm right, because sometimes you just have to buy the certificate to see exactly what's going on. Now let's look at a couple of case studies to see how we might put records together to resolve conflicts in our research. Do you remember William Churchill Jr, born in 1858, the father of Prothero? When did he die? It's presumably some time after the 1911 census, and I know his wife Elizabeth Ann dies in 1920. We can find William Elizabeth in the electoral rolls at the British Library at the same address as on the 1911 census, up till 1920, after which Elizabeth was no longer recorded, and there's no sign of William after 1924. So do we assume that the GRO death index entry for William Churchill, who dies in 1924, in roughly the right registration district with the right age, is the correct death entry? Now there's a burial entry from Parish Registers on the Five Mile Past website that seems to tie in well with a death entry in 1924. That shows a William Churchill buried in Ebber Vale and gives the address where he resided in the parish. Now Ebber Vale is not too far from where Elizabeth and Anne had lived, but it's not quite right. So I need to check that, that the William of Ebber Vale had lived in that address for some time and hence couldn't be my William. Indeed, I found the Ebber Vale address in 1911 and there is a William Churchill born, not in Herefordshire, as my William was, but in Staffordshire. The actual death certificate shows the informant as a son William, and my William Churchill didn't have a son William, so that pretty much rules out this man and his death in 1924. So it seems William Churchill dies after 1924, and extending the search in the death indexes shows there's another William Churchill of the right age whose death is recorded in 1946 in the right county, but again in a registration district some way from where he had lived in 1924. So if William Churchill lived up till 1946, then we should be able to find him in the 1939 register. And indeed there is a William Churchill, born on the right date, 24th of November 1858, living in the same household with William A. Pugh and Elizabeth Jane Pugh, and an Ida Williams formerly right, at somewhere called Brinteg Avenue, Pont Llanfraith, Monmouthshire. This ties up with a will index entry showing the same address and people in 1946. So what's my William Churchill doing here? Well, his family in 1911 included not only Prothero, but a daughter, Elizabeth Jane Churchill, and it's not too difficult to identify her first marriage to Daniel Wright in 1919, the birth of their daughter, Ida, in 1920, Daniel's death in 1925, and Elizabeth Jane's second marriage to William Arthur Pugh in 1932. 
So I'm guessing that William went to live with his daughter sometime after 1924, possibly about, about the same time as she was widowed. So even if the relationships aren't made expressly clear in the will index entry or the 1939 register, you can piece information together to see what's going on. It's by using these records together that I'm now quite confident that my great-grandfather, William Churchill, died in 1946. Here's another conflict that I'm still working on. All the censuses show that Bertha Lewis, May Williams, was born in Cardiff around 1868. There's only one Bertha Williams in Cardiff, shown in the indexes around that time, and that birth certificate shows her as being born on the 4th of December 1868, registered on the 12th of January 1869. There is a corresponding baptismal entry for this Bertha Williams, baptised on the 9th of December 1868 at the Church of Cardiff St John. Now we appear to have a conflict with the dates shown for Bertha in the 1939 register, where she is now Bertha Lewis, at the right address with her husband Abraham Lewis. So here her birth date is recorded as either the 1st of November 1868 or later corrected to the 31st of October 1868. Now while it's not impossible, a baptism just five days after a birth is quite quick, unless the child is very sickly. You'd expect it to be a few weeks afterwards. Given that the regulations for registering a birth said it should be registered within 42 days, I'm wondering if the actual date on the certificate was fudged a bit to fall within the allotted time rather than incur some penalty for non-registration. And Bertha later used what she knew to be her actual birth date-ish. The 9th of December date falls just within the 42-day time period, whereas the 31st of October or the 1st of November would have been well out of time. A number of genealogical authorities suggest it's not unusual for birth dates to be, to be manipulated to fall within the 42-day registration period, and it would be useful to know how a particular local registrar dealt with the rather, rather complicated rules and fines appertaining to late and non-registrations. So here's a conflict I haven't quite resolved, but I'm beginning to think that the date on the birth certificate might be the one that's wrong. So to conclude... We've looked thus far at some general ideas to think about when looking at a genealogical brick wall in the period of the 19th and 20th centuries, using commonly used records found on Find My Past. We've built up evidence to reach a satisfactory and testable hypothesis of how to consider if you have the right ancestor. The tr trick is to put records together, to use them to build up the evidence. We've seen some useful techniques and strategies to build upon. In my next talk, I'll be using similar techniques and earlier sources to think about solving genealogical conundrums that occur before 1837.